Number 1. On the evening of December 9, 2007, in North Richland Hills, Texas, 67-year-old Marianne Wilkinson was sitting at home with her husband when the doorbell rang. Marianne got up to answer the door and was immediately shot by a still unknown assailant. Neighbors stated that they heard three or four gunshots and immediately called the police. Despite police arriving almost instantly and attempting to resuscitate her, Marianne died at the scene of the crime on her front porch. But around 8 p.m., Marianne answered her door and was killed. Police say she was shot at least three times. Her husband, who was still in the home, frantically called the police. My wife has just been shot, Don said over the phone to 911. Somebody rang the doorbell and then shot her, I need some help quick. Detectives have always believed that the gunfire at Marianne's door was not meant for her. The 68-year-old was beloved and had no enemies. Her son Mike Wilkinson and his wife Terry don't forget that night, especially over the holidays. You always live with it and it changes you forever, Mike said. You know there's no rationality for going to someone's door and shooting them no matter who they are. The hardest part to come to grips with is that no arrests have been made for 12 years. Police have looked at three persons of interest, however. Their names are Dennis Taylor, Vincent Lane, and Willie Bowley. Per our partners at the Fort Worth Star-Telegram in 2013, Taylor's wife lived in a home with the same address number, on a parallel cul-de-sac a block away, from the Wilkinson home. She and Taylor were going through a divorce at the time of Wilkinson's death. Bowley was believed to be an employee of Taylor's. However, Bowley was killed in Oklahoma City in 2013, following a domestic dispute with his girlfriend. The girlfriend told police that Bowley had been beating her, and then she shot him. Since the killing, the gun that was used to commit the crime has been found, and a partial fingerprint was lifted from one of the casings at the scene. DNA was also collected, but for years Mike and his wife Terry have watched the case receive very little traction. There's still this loss that's there, Mike said. Mom was a lot of fun, mom was one who knew how to love and appreciate. That's the difficult part is waiting. Mike's wife Terry echoed a similar feeling. I just think about all the things she has missed, Terry said. Everything joyful has the stab of sorrow, because she's missing it. North Richland Hills recently revisited the Wilkinson case, after the family encouraged them to. DNA collected from the scene, that was once little to no help was re-examined, and with technological advancements, a new DNA profile was created for a possible suspect. The good news is that law enforcement can use that profile to search through multiple law enforcement databases for a match. So far, however, no positive hits just yet. For Mike and his family, it's a huge piece to a puzzle they've been trying to put together for years. We're very grateful and very hopeful that it will turn into something, he said. I just want to see justice, Terry followed up. Inside the Wilkinson's home is a number of things that belong to Marianne. Handmade ornaments are on the tree, Christmas figurines are in the kitchen, and paintings that were once Marianne's are on the walls. Terry said they bring her family comfort and remind them of the memories they had with the 68-year-old. As they surrounded the living room, the Wilkinsons said all they can do now is wait. Something they've gotten good at over the years. I would feel rested, and it doesn't seem right, to not have justice on this side of the grave, Terry said. If you know anything about the person, who is responsible for the death of Marianne Wilkinson, call the North Richland Hills Police Department. Number 2 While some have heated up and been solved, when people come forward or evidence is retested, other cases remain on the books, without answers for families whose loved ones were lost. The last time anyone besides her killer saw Makiko Kasahara alive, she was bubbly about her college grades, at a party held in her college apartment. On Deck, 13, 2002, the Texas Lutheran University student celebrated the end of her school term with a small group of friends at her Seguin apartment into the wee hours of the following morning. It was a high moment for the young Japanese woman, only 21, 
who expected excellent grades for her freshman fall term. The next time people saw Kasahara, the following morning after a neighbor reported a fire, she was unrecognizable, a skeleton pulled from her burned-out apartment in the 900 block of San Antonio Avenue. She had been partying with friends, not three hours, earlier. In the time between seeing her friends and the neighbor noticing the fire, Kasahara had been strangled and suffered numerous other injuries. After she died, someone lit her body on fire. Travis County, Texas, Deputy Medical Examiner Elizabeth Peacock ruled that Kasahara died as a result of homicidal violence including, but not limited to strangulation. Along with a broken bone in her larynx, Mikiko also suffered a pelvis injury accompanied by significant hemorrhaging. Forensic specialists couldn't determine the source of the injury because Kasahara's body was so badly burned, according to the report. In the weeks following her death, reports detailed the Travis County Medical Examiner's office findings. Officials indicated that a bone in Kasahara's larynx was broken at the joint and another joint was fused. In addition, she had profound injury with much hemorrhage within the pelvis, but that remains a mystery due to the burned state of her body. In its official report, the office found Kasahara died as a result of homicidal violence including, but not limited to strangulation. No alcohol or drugs were found in her body. Read more on the report from the Seguin Gazette. Law enforcement said in various reports that there were several people of interest in the case, and while some were eliminated, others remained suspects. In 2005, then Seguin Police Chief Luis Calazo revealed the most detail about the killer in the reporting, we reviewed about the case. Calazo told the publication that he believes the person who killed Casahara was a man, but, as the report noted, stopped short of referring to the murder as a crime of passion. Seguin Police Department Detective Jamie Diaz told us that in the years since the crime, authorities recreated the crime scene, and a burned laptop from the scene was processed for information. Authorities, he said, found Asian female porn on the computer that was accessed around the time of Kasahara's murder. However, no physical evidence could be retrieved from the computer's surface due to its condition after the fire. Kasahara's murder has never been solved, though many detectives have taken up the case and tried for years, with personal, passionate interest in the case, to crack it. In particular, Maureen Watson, a now retired captain of the Seguin Police Department, worked the case for a considerable amount of time, collecting thick binders of information on the case that she regularly reviewed. The case reportedly left her sleepless, haunting her every December as the anniversary drew near. Watson met the Kasahara family when they visited Texas Lutheran University. Watson told a reporter in 2005 that the family has forgiven the killer and only asks for an apology and explanation. That only spurred Watson on more. To me, this is as vivid today as it was the day I was called there, Watson told the Seguin Gazette. This is far from a cold case, and I won't let it become a cold case. I will not stop, and this department will not stop, even if I go away, until this is solved or we have absolutely exhausted all our resources. This young girl deserves that. Though the case did go cold, as it is now classified that way by the Department of Public Safety, Watson's promise is being kept by Seguin law enforcement. Detective Diaz is following up on the case, though at this time there are no leads or physical evidence to follow up on. Diaz said he looks over the case when he can to see if he's missed anything. I talk to the mom every year, Diaz said. She's a doctor and she come down from Japan to conferences every year. Nice lady. I can't give her any good news. Diaz said Kasahara was someone who didn't seek out trouble, and was truly the victim of a heinous crime. Diaz said Kashara's mother gave him a good luck charm, that he hangs in his home. It's a reminder to him to go back and check over the case. I can't let this one go, he told us. I got to get back on that, we do remember, you learn so much about the victim, it's almost like they're a family member to you. If you have any information on this case, submit a tip through the Texas Rangers Cold Case website or call 1-800-346-3243. Your information will be forwarded to the Texas Ranger assigned to the case, a $3,000 reward is now offered. 
Number 3. The Texas Department of Public Safety is asking for the public's help in solving the murder of 82-year-old Jose Jasso of Pecos. On March 23, 2010, DPS responded to Jasso's ranch in Pecos after his remains were discovered that day, Texas Ranger Philip Breeding said in the episode. Evidence at the scene pointed to an altercation between Jasso and another individual, and foul play was suspected in his death. Jasso's home on the ranch was burned down, and his 2000 Chevrolet truck was missing when officers arrived. Two days later, his truck was found abandoned at a business in Odessa. A witness who knew Jasso told investigators he saw a woman driving Jasso's truck before his remains were discovered. He provided a composite sketch of a woman wearing sunglasses with her hair in a ponytail. Someone in Pecos knows what happened to Mr. Jasso, Breeding says in the episode. Eleven years later, we're still not any closer to solving it than we were back then. We need you to come forward and help us give this family some closure. Jasso's son, Jose Luis Jasso, described his father as strong-bodied and kind, and someone who went to church every Sunday and Wednesday. If anybody knows anything, I want to know, Jose Luis Jasso said. I want to know who killed my father. There have been suspects identified in the case, but no one has been charged with any crimes, according to information about the investigation on the DPS website. Jasso was a personable man with a large family and had no known enemies. Texas Crime Stoppers is offering a $3,000 reward to anyone who comes forward with information that leads to the arrest of the person responsible. Anyone with information on Jasso's murder is asked to contact the Texas Rangers at 1-800-346-3243. Number 4. The Texas Rangers are hoping a big reward can generate some warm leads in a murder case that's gone cold. It's been 27 years since the body of Samantha Zublionis was found in rural northeastern Frio County. The San Antonio High School student was only 17 years old. Joe Anna Zublionis, Samantha's older sister, still gets emotional visiting her grave. You become numb because she was there and then she wasn't, says Joanna. And you don't have any answers to what happened. Due to her father's military service, Samantha is buried at Fort Sam Houston National Cemetery. Back in August of 1994, she was starting her senior year at MacArthur High School and had a job at Wendy's. But she no longer lived with her parents. I brought her to my house to stay with me, says Joanna. She was emancipated as an adult. Samantha and Joe Anna were living near Loop 410 and Nacogdoches Road, in a complex known at the time as the Danbury Apartments. However, shortly before she disappeared, Samantha decided to move in with some teenagers, who also lived at the complex. It was only a matter of weeks from the time, that she made that decision that I got the notification that she had been found dead, remembers Joe Anna. Samantha was last seen August 30th. Days later, on September 3rd, her body would be discovered southwest of San Antonio, in rural Frio County. The Texas Rangers led the investigation, which determined she was the victim of a homicide. At the same time, Joe Anna says she led her own investigation. Just trying to figure out, okay, this is where she was staying, let's look at the cars around there, says Joe Anna. She was hanging out with some kids, I don't know, they were teenagers. But with little evidence and few leads to go on, Samantha's murder case eventually went cold. I just thought it was over with, admits Joanna, it just got buried. This week though, everything changed with a phone call. I started shaking when I got a call from the Texas Rangers. 24 years later, the Rangers are putting a spotlight on Samantha's case, offering up to $6,000 for information leading to an arrest. Wow, somebody does care, says Joanna. Somebody finally cares, my father is on his deathbed right now, it would be a miracle if we could get this solved. Joanna says she knows somebody's out there, somebody knows something, b, they need to come forward, she says. They just need to come forward, they need to talk to the Texas Rangers, 
They need to put this to rest, Samantha deserves it. If you know what happened to Samantha Ziblioni's, call 1-800-252-TIPS, you can remain anonymous. With the Texas Rangers and the good lord on our side, Joanna says, miracles happen all the time. Number 5 The oldest unsolved cold case on the Texas Department of Public Safety website is the brutal beating and shooting murder of a 17-year-old in Sonora, Texas. It happened in 1953, that 17-year-old was Raul Pete Aravalo. He was working as a gas station attendant back when gas stations had attendants. Raul was 5 feet 6 inches tall and weighed about 130 pounds. The Devil's River News wrote that on the night, he went missing he wore a leather jacket and a green cap with Philip 66 written on it. He wore a blue shirt and pants and ankle-high boots. He lived and worked in Sonora, Texas, known as the area where the hill country meets West Texas. It's small town on the way to or from Big Bend, as its website says. It's where Raul worked at Pat Lyle's Buick Company. It's reportedly where two strange men pulled up on February 23rd and said they'd run out of gas a few miles east of town on the junction road. Raul left with the two men in the company's truck, and when he didn't return, someone called authorities. Authorities found the vehicle nearly eight miles away, west of Sonora. Then, a slow trickle of discoveries. On Tuesday, Raul's wallet with only a social security card, inside found 12 miles west of Sonora, then other documents, including an application for a birth certificate, found 20 miles west. Found, but so many questions remain. On Sunday, March 3, 1953, Raul's badly beaten body was discovered. Very little information about this case is available beyond the Department of Public Safety's profile. On a Facebook page called Justice for Raul Aravalo newspaper clippings purportedly from 1953, editions of the Sonora paper show the boy's haunting black and white photo and chart developments in the case, from his status as missing to gruesome, explicit images taken shortly after his body was located. One newspaper clip describes what happened when a Mrs. Rayford Lee Hull was out on a Sunday drive with her husband. Around 5 p.m., she spotted him, clipping say. The Devil's River News clipping notes that the body was only 13 feet from the pavement and well hidden amid catclaw bushes about 1.4 miles east of Sonora. She'd spied his green Phillips 66 cap first, blown away out into the open and then spotted his shoes. His killer or killers had hidden his body under a, a clump of catclaw and wedged between two large rocks. The newspaper noted a trail of blood from the road showed that he had been carried to the hiding place. Nearly a week after he'd gone missing, photos in his hometown paper showed his badly beaten body almost in full. A notice on the same page announced his funeral. He was buried in the Sonora Cemetery. Raul's death was ruled a murder. An autopsy reportedly showed that he'd been severely beaten around the groin area and other parts of his body. His jaw had been broken, as well as his skull in several places. He'd also been shot through the back of his head with a 45. Raul had been dead about three days when he was found, according to reports citing doctors. That meant that his killers, who had taken him more than a week, before had held him somewhere for a time, before he was ultimately killed. At the time, forensic investigations were not what they are today. The secrets his body and the crime scene could have exposed remain untold, a result of living and dying in another time. A publication noted that officers said it was the most vicious killing in the county's history. Posted by Justice for Raul Aravalo on Friday, July 27, 2018. Early in March, the Devil's River News reported that a search had produced two leads and investigations had been made in Del Rio and San Angelo, though officers weren't ready to release the results. Two men arrested in San Antonio after a gas station holdup were photographed, and their photos were going to be sent to Simon Aravalo, Raul's father who had apparently seen the two men, that Raul went with the day he went missing. He told one publication that one of the men was about 38 years old and spoke to him about the cold weather. This man walked up to where I was working while they were getting the truck ready. 
He said to me, it's expletive cold this morning. I said, yes, it's pretty cold, all right. Number 6. If you're driving along U.S. Highway 277, about 34 miles south of Sonora, Texas, and you see a memorial for the Ariano family, on the side of the road, Pete Gomez Sr. wants you to know they didn't die in a crash. Five members of that family were brutally murdered in two places, near the memorial on a mid-April night in 1968, and the killer remains unknown. The only survivor was the Ariano's four-year-old son, Manuel Jr., who had been shot in the back of the head and stabbed. According to a Standard Times report, a massive manhunt was organized right away. Standard Times, April 18, 1968 The hunt for an unknown killer was underway today in the sparsely set countryside north of Del Rio, following the discovery of four victims of an apparent mass murder. The adult dead were identified as Juan Manuel Ariano, 25 years old, Monica Lopez Ariano, 24 years old, Maria Antonia Lopez Cantu, 19 years old. Besides the two women, one man and a child were found dead, but two young children were hurt but still alive. The bodies were found along a two to three mile stretch of U.S. Highway 277 inside the Edwards County line. One of the surviving children died two days later. Gomez, who in 1968 was working for the highway department on a project to widen the road, said the tragedy has been on his mind for decades. This year, he decided to have a monument engraved, so people will know what happened there. According to clippings from that year, the ghastly crime scenes were difficult to sort out, even for experienced officers. In the days following the deaths, more information was released by officials, who called the slayings a sadistic bloodbath. Babies were stabbed and beaten, a teenage girl stripped naked, apparently raped and then killed, and a helpless mother and father either bludgeoned, shot or stabbed to death. No apparent death weapon has been found by law officers. Huge stab wounds ripped the toddler's back. He was found face down in a patch of weeds, not far from the body of his father. According to reports, the chain of events began when the family's 1958, Buick got a flat tire near Alta Loma, in Edwards County, between Sonora and Del Rio. Highway workers reported speaking to Ariano about 6 p.m., April 16, as he worked to change the tire. Five miles north of that location, they had another flat tire. A driver for oil field bus lines, who drove that route twice a day said, he spotted a white pickup parked near the family car, at the second location about 7 p.m. Several witnesses' testimony agreed that the family was seen in the company of a large Anglo man dressed in elaborate cowboy clothes later on in Sonora, as the Arianos got the tire repaired at a local service station. The man was described as a little more than six feet tall and weighing about 200 pounds. The gas station attendant told authorities the man was 30 to 35 years old, with sandy hair, light eyebrows, and pockmarks or a rash on his neck. He wore a straw cowboy hat, had boots with an eagle design on the side, and his pants were tucked into them. He wore a large hunting knife on his belt, and his vehicle was described as a two-tone 1967 Chevrolet Fleetside Series 10 pickup, with a white top and a green or blue bottom. Witnesses told investigators Ariano and his son walked to a nearby cafe and ordered hamburgers while the tire was repaired. The bus driver said he saw the Ariano's car on his way back from Del Rio later that night. At some point, investigators believe, things took a deadly turn, and by the time the sun came up, several murders had taken place. The victims were found by men, working on the nearby Whitehead Ranch, who followed a blood trail from one of the ranch's gates to a large tree nearby. News reports revealed that the family of migrant workers hailed from Villa de Fuentes, near Piedras Negras, Mexico, and were on their way to San Angelo according to relatives. Ariano's brother-in-law Bobby Chaveria, 33 years old, of San Angelo, told a reporter his expectant wife, who was the sister of Juan Ariano, had taken the news of the murders roughly. Chaveria said, my brother-in-law in Crystal City called me and said they were coming up to see my wife. I think it hurt her worse because they were coming to see us. Chaveria said family members, 
were working to contact his father-in-law, who was working in California with his other sons. Gomez said when the idea of setting a memorial stone at the scene of the crimes came to him, he set out to find exactly where the murders happened. We never did go out there, he said. I don't know why, we just didn't, and I didn't know exactly where it happened, so I tried to find out, but all the information was in Rock Springs, down in Edwards County. Gomez said in the end, he visited with a man who had worked on the Whitehead Ranch, and he described a position, that would be roughly equidistant, between the two locations where bodies were found. Gomez is in his 80s, and although he has broken both hips, he successfully underwent surgery and rehabilitation, and he works most days. Rock work gives him great satisfaction, and his cozy home shows his creativity. I'm a jack of all trades, I like to work, and I did all of this here, he said, gesturing at the exterior of his home. I like to build houses. It was a Friday morning, and he had been working at a project house in town a little before noon. I'm originally from Sonora, we got married in 1959, and I worked for the department for 22 years, and then I went to work for Atlantic Richfield in El Dorado, and Midland for 35 years, but we moved back after I retired. Gomez talked about his family's connection to the case. This boy, they took him to Del Rio, and he was flown to San Antonio from Del Rio, and it just so happened that my younger sister, who's an RN, was working at that hospital where they took him, and she said they had guards day and night watching over him. Later, Texas Ranger A.Y. Ali Jr. got in touch with the Border Patrol, and my youngest sister's husband, who could speak fluent English and Spanish, was asked if he would go and talk to that boy, as an interpreter, and he said, yes, Gomez said. According to news reports from 1969, it took investigators some time to interview young Manuel Jr., as the boy could not read or write yet and only spoke Spanish. Additionally, his hearing was severely damaged by the gunshot wound to his head. Manuel, Jr. told questioners that the big cowboy was shooting at rabbits and deer out the window on the way back from Sonora, which upset Mr. Ariano. The boy said his father tried to stop the man and took the gun away. A struggle ensued, and when his father ran away, the man shot him, Gomez recalled. When I talked to the ranch hand that worked for Mr. Whitehead, he told me he saw that blood at the gate and then followed it to the big tree where she lay, Gomez said. But he told me they weren't just in one bunch, they were in two places, and he told some of them were near one big live oak tree and the others were farther away, near a bigger oak tree, so I decided to put the monument in between the two, 34 miles south of here, on the west side of the highway. According to him, there was just one man, and the man that done it, they said he was in Sonora several days, before he committed these crimes. Gomez said he has always felt like the crimes of 1968, may have had some connection to the brutal murder, of 17-year-old Raul Arevalo in Sonora in 1953. Arevalo was beaten to death after taking gasoline to a motorist's vehicle on the junction highway. He was considered missing for six days, before his body was found. Gomez said it's unfortunate the killer has never been found, and he hopes there is still someone alive, who could shed some light on what happened that night. The Edwards County Sheriff's Office lists the Ariano murders as a cold case on its website. Anyone with information is encouraged to call them at 830-683-4104.